Good to see you this morning. Derek is preaching at the coast this morning. We'll be back this evening. We want to talk about intimacy with God. And when I think of that topic, the passages that came to my mind were passages like this. I was in my prime when God's intimate friendship blessed my house. For the crooked man is an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. My servant Moses is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, not in dark sayings. Abraham believed in God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called. He was called the friend of God. When I look at all these passages, it seems that there's kind of a common thread. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Abide in me, and I in you. By this we know that we've come to know him, if we keep his commandments. You know, I contemplate those passages, and one of the things that runs through all of them is trust. Friendship, openness, closeness, warmth with God, intimacy with God, it all boils down to faithful obedience and trust in Him. Enoch walked with God. That is, he was faithful. God was intimate with Moses, spoke to him face to face as a man talks to his friend, because Moses was faithful in all his house. Abraham was called the friend of God because he trusted God. Jesus says the person who really loves him is the person who obeys him. And John says the, people who, the person who really knows God is the person who obeys him. Friendship with God is not an exclusive club as far as for some pre-selected elite. And yet, yet, God does choose his friends. He chooses people with good hearts. 1 Samuel 16, verse 17, God says, I don't look on the outside, I look on the inside. I don't judge a man by the outside, I look at his heart. His loyalty, will he trust? And you know what? I can have a good heart, so can you. I can be a friend to God. A good heart is something anyone can give, anyone can offer a good, honest heart. Anyone can trust God if they so choose. Are we ready? Someone compared Christianity to like a, a lake or a frozen pond. We have it on good authority that the ice is really thick on that pond, or really thick on that lake. Some of us, though, will, will only eke out bit by bit, very cautious. Other people will run out with abandon onto the lake. Which one are you? When you have it on good authority from God that the ice is thick, do you still creep out bit by bit, or do you run out with abandon? Do we inch by inch towards God or do we run towards God for an intimate relationship with Him? You might feel like, well, I don't feel close to God, though. C.S. Lewis said, if you want to get warm, you got to stand next to the fire. If you want to get wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy and power and peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are not the sort of prize which God could, if he choose, just hand out to anyone. They are the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you. If you are not, you will remain dry. Once a man is united with the God, how could he not live forever? And once a man is separated from God, what could he do but wither and die? And that's what Jesus was getting at in John chapter 15. Apart from me, you can't do anything. 
Abide in me and I in you. You're not the vine, you're a branch. The source is God. If you want intimacy, if you want joy, if you want salvation, then you must get into Him. You must have a relationship with Him. Galatians 3 tells us very quickly that it's through faith and baptism that we get into Christ. But God wants us to keep it close because maybe there was a time that all of us here that are Christians came into Christ. When Jesus told us in John 15, 4, to abide in him, what he's saying is stay close to me, stick to me, trust me, keep that relationship tight. In 2 John 9, and you might think, some of might think, this is the last passage that you would ever think to be thrown into a sermon on intimacy with God. 2 John 9 says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. You might say, what does that have to do with intimacy? Here's what it has to do with intimacy. Intimacy is all about trust. Abide in me is trust me. Mark, don't run ahead, Mark. Don't run ahead of me, Mark. Mark, don't myths represent me, Mark. Mark, don't put words in my mouth, Mark. Mark, here's the line. Stay with the line, okay? Okay. Abide in me. Trust me. Don't make up more rules. Don't make up any of your own. Abide in me. Abide in my teaching. Trust it. Trust it that that's all you need. Trust it that it will work. Trust that it will get you to point where you need to be. Don't run ahead of God. Don't misrepresent Him. Don't put words in His mouth. Don't speak for Him. The person who does not abide in Scripture is in effect saying that they value their independence more than their intimacy with God. That I want to be the center of the story rather than my relationship with Him being the center of the story. Abide in me. Trust me. Keep the relationship tight. Same thing when he said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You are my friends if you do what I say. Because if you're doing what I say, I can tell you, trust me. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, there's a great passage as far as it it indicates some intimacy has been lost in this congregation. It is a great congregation. Jesus says a lot of great things about this congregation. In verse 2, in the book of Revelation, we picture Jesus in the end of the first chapter walking among the lampstands. And the last part of chapter 1 tells us that the congregations are the lampstands. Beaverton is a lampstand. It is a light on the lampstand. And Jesus is inspecting us. Are we doing everything we need to be doing? Do we still belong to Him? And He says great things about them. He knows their deeds. He knows their toil and perseverance. They can't tolerate evil men. They don't put up with that. They, they test things. They prove it by Scripture. They've been persevered and they have not grown weary, in verse 3, for his name's sake. But I have this against you, he says. You've left your first love. What's that look like? I mean, what's that mean, you've left your first love? What's that look like? Well, what does it look like when someone is no longer that into you? What's that look like? What's it look like when you're dating someone and you can tell they're no longer into you? Well, they don't talk too much anymore. That communication really dries up. Or it's very superficial. They find other things to do than being with you. They would rather be with somebody else. They don't have time for you or that much time for you anymore. You're not a priority with them. There's really no intensity anymore. They don't need you. 
That's what it looks like when somebody is not that into you anymore. May I suggest to you that that, that directly translates into a passage like this. You've left your first love. When we're not into Jesus that much anymore, our prayer life wanes. Our priorities, our commitments, being at services, doing things, spreading the gospel, talking about Him. It naturally sounds like we're not that into Him anymore. One writer said, I once read a book by the counselor Jay Adams that our problem is often not that we don't know what to do, but we don't keep doing it long enough. We don't sustain things. Like I start fixing my attention on the stream of experience and ordinariness instead of on Christ. All my thoughts are on things this week, not on eternal things. I get tyrannized by busyness. I'm busy but not going anywhere. I'm busy but not in the things that are going to matter in the end. I allow what's true, what's important to get hazy in my mind. All cloudy. I get fixated on little daily annoyances and lose sight of the fact that I am saved. I get trapped in fears of the future or regrets of the past. I get bogged down in worldly contentedness, even with wretched things. You know people like that. You know people that are contented in wretched things. Is the devil trying to get you there? Has the devil ever got you in has the devil ever got you at a point in your life where he made you happy to eat dirt? You know any people in relationships that the devil has made contented and they're eating garbage and they're eating dirt? Well, at least he still comes home at night. At least he still has a job. You know any people like that? In absolute wretchedness in their relationships. And yet, well, that's okay. The devil's got you to a point that you're happy eating dirt. Young people, never let the devil get to the point that you're happy. That you're happy eating dirt and crumbs in life. Do you ever hear people talk like that? Yeah, me and my wife don't get along much anymore. We're divorced and stuff like that. But, you know, you know, and we still talk to everyone now and then. Where's the devil got you? You're eating dirt. And you're happy. Wake up. I skip a prayer time here and a prayer time there, and I tell myself it's temporary and it's reversible, and I can always catch up. It's... You know, I'm getting back to it. I start thinking visible things are more real than invisible things. I don't fight back against spiritual laziness, apathy, and depression. I don't fight back. <coughs> this, what, this is what it looks like when you're in to somebody. I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to talk to you. I can't wait to share something with you. I can't wait to see you. Isn't that when you're into someone? When you're dating someone, you know when they're into you because they can't wait to see you. Can't get enough of you, and you can't get enough of them. And you'd rather spend time with them than anyone else. And you will drop stuff. You will drop stuff to be with them. And and they make the trip. When you are into somebody, you want them to be with you. I know, I know a lot of people like now and then like to do the, you know, you'll hear about, you know, the men's weekend, the girls' weekend and stuff like that. I, I can understand why people do that, but part of me says, I, I was single too long. <laughs> I don't want to be, be by myself anymore. I heard one sports commentator say that's the reason. Don't ever, don't ever do the bachelor parties, guys. 
You end up at 3 o'clock in the morning with a, in a limo with the same losers you started out with at the beginning of the night. When you're married, when you're married, when you fall in love with someone, they make the trip. You want them to be there. It's not a vacation without them. It is not a trip without them. When you're in the Jesus, no one has to remind us to pray when we're in the Jesus. No one has to remind us to spend time listening to him. No one has to remind us to read our Bible when we're in the Jesus. No one has to motivate us to worship and be there and remember his death and be with other Christians. No one, no one has to prod us to freely talk about him. And we don't look at anybody else. And the devil does. The devil tries us to get to look at other things out there. And when you're in the Jesus, you go, no, I have no interest. I have no interest in any other loyalty. I have no interest in any other love or any other faith. Don't even bother me with that. You're wasting my time. Once heard William F. Buckley say that at swinging Beltway parties, and that's in the D.C. area, that's within the loop there, you can get away with mentioning God once or maybe twice, but try it a third time, and you'll never be invited back. They don't want to hear about God that much within the Beltway. But here's a man who made a comment four centuries ago. Alas, the misery of the unconverted is so great that it calls loudest for our compassion. I think we see that in Mark 9 with Jesus. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples in John 4, the fields are white to harvest. It is so sad to see them in a state of damnation that methinks, and that's a real word, methinks, we should not be able to let them alone, either in public or in private. Whatever of the work we have to do. Isn't that a great comment? How can you leave people alone? No. How can you leave people alone when you know they're headed towards damnation? How can you not talk about Jesus to them? Well, I don't want to offend them. Who cares? Bother them in private. Bother them in public. They're headed towards damnation. I know we sing that song, you never mentioned him to me. If you want to sing a song that makes people in the audience feel guilty, that's the one you hit. I've been asking a lot of people, what do you think our national anthem is? You know what? It's our God, he is alive. That's his, it's number nine. That's, that's the, when you sing that song, that's our, that's our national anthem. Our God, he is alive. But that song, you never mentioned him to me. You know what a lot of us might hear at Judgment Day, though, is from people, why didn't you try harder to save me? Because I think we, we do mention Christ to people, but I think the thought, why didn't you try harder? Why didn't you try harder? I think that man has it right. Someone has to help those people. Someone has to try real hard. No matter what else, we, no matter what, well, we got a lot of things to do. But we just can't leave them alone. Or give a token effort. Talk to me. When you're in the Jesus, you pray to him. But what do you pray to him about? No real friendship can exist without communication. On the one side, God has communicated freely with us. He has given us everything we need, 2 Peter 1 through. He is not held back. Therefore, don't be surprised if our relationship or friendship with God is not what it could be if we're not pouring out our hearts to Him in prayer. And why shouldn't we? He cares for us tenderly as a father does. The prayer of the upright is His delight. Proverbs 15 and verse 8 it's interesting, the Psalms, though, the Psalms says the Bible's our delight. The writer of Psalm 119 talked about the Bible being his delight, Scripture being his delight. Psalm 19, it's sweeter than the honeycomb. 
I delight in thy love. I love thy law, the writer said. You know what God says to us? He doesn't say, I love your law. He says, I love your prayers. That's what intimacy is. We love God talking to us. We love God speaking to us. And of course, the way he does that is in Scripture. Let me give you one verse back in Proverbs chapter 6. Along those lines. In verse 22, it talks about parental instruction. What you were taught as a kid from godly parents. When you walk about, they will guide you. That is what your mom and dad told you will guide you as you live. When you sleep, what mom and dad taught you will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk to you. 30 years, 30 years after you've left home, 30 years after you've left home, your mom and dad are still talking to you. Years after they've died, they're still talking to you in their instruction. That's exactly the same way they go away. God talks to us. You're sitting there in the office, you're out there, you're out there, you wake up in the morning and you remember something God said in the scripture. And that will stick with you all your life. And, and we delight in that. We, we delight, we relish that. We relish what God says in Scripture. But sometimes what we don't realize is that God delights in our communication to Him. He loves when we pray. He loves our prayers. They are regarded as sweet incense before Him. As a beautiful smell. But do we really talk to Him? Friends talk to friends on a deeper level than merely exchanging information. Are are our prayers just more on the information level, on kind of a superficial level? God wants the same type of deep communication. He wants to hear about our troubles and struggles, inner turmoil, casting all your anxiety upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7. That's one verse I would use to indicate that God wants more than just an update on what the weather is and whether people are traveling or not. God's what, God's what, God wants a deeper level than that. He wants to hear about our cares. Tell him how much you appreciate him. When's the last time he, he told God, here's all the reasons I appreciate you. Here's where you've made a difference in my life. Here's what I'm scared of. Here's what my fears are. Here's what my worries are. Here's the people I want to save. Here's the people I really care about. Here's the things I want to get over and break and fight against. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand this first. I don't understand why this happens in life. Here's where I'm overwhelmed. Here's what I'm up against. Here's where I don't feel competent. Here's where I don't feel confident. Here's where I need wisdom, God. James chapter 1 verse 5. Here's a situation I don't know what to do with. I don't know which way to move. I got some judgment calls here. I don't know which one to make. I don't know how to approach someone or that person. Sometimes you stand back and just say, I don't know how I've made it. Do you do that sometimes? Sometimes you even do that economically. I don't know how we've been able to keep our head above water all these years. Somehow, there are times that we had nothing in the bank, nothing in savings. There are times that we had more in savings. But it just seemed that most of my life, it's simply been enough. Has that been your history? That God, that you've simply had enough? Is it an answer to prayer? God, give us this day our daily bread. Has God given you enough? Here you are, 50 years old or whatever, and you haven't starved. And you got a roof over your heads. 
And God has always given you enough. And sometimes that's one of the best things. Kept me dependent on that daily bread. I don't know how we've made it here. <laughs> I don't know how we've survived. Well, it's with him. How he has taken such good care of us all these years. Intimacy, you have to get beyond what I might call polite prayers. And nothing wrong with a prayer that talks about being with those who are traveling and things like that. But you've got to get beyond that. You've got to read the Psalms and the things that people struggle with and the prayers for vindication and the prayers for people's souls and the spiritual battles people fought. You've got to get to that level of prayer. Or asking God to do whatever it takes to bring people back and People that are defiant and unrepentant, that they that who are causing great harm, that God would act, that God would arise and demonstrate his power, as he'd done many times before. Are you proud of him? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1 16. Are you proud of God? 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul told Timothy, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of me or the testimony of our Lord. Are you proud of him? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11, Jesus is proud of us. It says he's not ashamed to call us brethren. So those are my friends down though. That's my family. When I think of not being ashamed of God, I think of David as the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem. And David is out there in his linen ephod, dancing with all his might. Verse 14, 2 Samuel 6. And his wife isn't impressed. But when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. She was not impressed. She was very embarrassed. One writer said, I love this about David, that he's so into the Lord that he forgot his regal manners. Forgot his station in life. He forgot snobbery and social roles that we create for ourselves. The next thing you know, he'll be giving speeches at polite functions that tell a little bit too much truth. Or they're just a little too excited to be appropriate for the occasion. When you're in the God, when you have a close relationship with God, I think you tend to speak more. You probably tend to speak more than you should about God in people's minds. You go beyond human politeness and you, talk, you give more truth than people want in an occasion. Which is it? Am I uncomfortable talking about God or do I make people uncomfortable when I talk about God? Are you tired of being the one uncomfortable in life? Are you tired of being the one who's always told to be quiet? Are you, told, are you tired of being told, you know, you being uncomfortable? Why don't you make some other people uncomfortable and talk about God? Are we ashamed of certain parts of the Bible or are we ashamed of certain parts of our culture? Do we want to look good or do we want God to look good? Will we sacrifice God in order to keep certain friends or will we sacrifice certain friends in order to keep God? Where's the tightness? Where's the closeness? And is he enough for us? In the Old Testament, the Levites had no inheritance. They got no land. They had some cities, but they had no property. And it says, to the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. And if you were a Levite, and when you heard that, you don't get any land, God is your inheritance. Would you have been dissatisfied? Or would you have said, that's the inheritance I want? Can we go through life and feel blessed and happy knowing that 
God is our great reward. God is our inheritance. In the book of Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6, the other writer says this, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Thou dost support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I like what I got. I think that's what the writer says. I've been told the Lord is my inheritance, and that's a beautiful inheritance. I like that. I've been telling people that, of course, this week was tax day on Thursday. But since Thursday, I've been getting free stuff. I paid whatever I owed from last year, and then I had to send on my estimates, so I, because I do quarterly estimated taxes. So there were four checks that went out, two go to federal, two go to state. And I, I went to Taco Del Mar. I just feel like ta- going to Taco Del Mar, and they said, you got a free taco. And that night, I went to the Wades, and they said, we got some size 11 shoes. The only one who wants them, I looked at them, I'll take them. I got a free pair of shoes that night. We went to the men's class, and Barb said, we don't do pop or drink pop here. Who wants to go left over Coke? And I got a free half a liter of Coke. <laughs> and last night at the group meeting, where's the Rosario's? Tiffany had a free book. For me and Dina had brought a whole bunch of wonderful Dina's cookies. And I'm waiting for today. This is like a hitting streak. This is like a hitting streak on mine. But do you feel like that with God? Is that I like what I'm. Mark, God, what do I got? Mark, you got me. That's good. That's plenty for me. Is his friendship far more important than to us in all earthly rewards? Does his well done good and faithful servant trump everything else? Have you gotten to the point where choice, the choice of God is not a sacrifice? And that people who don't choose God, they're the ones making the huge sacrifice. They're the people missing out. They're the people that are impoverished. One other said, as we close, have you gotten to the place where you have stepped into obedience enough times and chosen the way of faith often enough that you've learned a very cool secret that the joy is immediate and the deepening intimacy with God is something that you wouldn't trade anything for? Last point. But it's too late. It's too late for me. Let me give you one more quote from an individual. She said, I'm a watchman calling out from the milestone of 58 years to you coming up behind me at 28, 38, 48. And this is what I cry. Never say it's too late. And it's no use, no matter what you've done. And I do not doubt that you've done plenty. The command to repent and believe and the command to be baptized is not issued to pretty good people. The command to believe, the command to repent, the command to be to confess, the command to be baptized is issued to one group of people, the ungodly. And if that's what you are this morning, then it's never too late. Today is the day of salvation. Whatever need you have, come with us who stand and sing together.